While at Corinth, Paul learned of a plot on his life. He changed plans. Instead of taking the ship, he walked inland up through Macedonia. He visited the churches he had planted one final time. He came to see the believers in Berea and Salonika and Philippi, encouraging them and sharing with them, encouraging them to walk faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus. Then he went down to Neapolis, caught a ship and sailed across the Aegean. Luke notes that this time it took him five days to make the passage. He came here to the great port city of Alexandrian Troas. They came here to the great city and met the other disciples who had come ahead of them. And here Paul stayed teaching for seven days. Luke records a fascinating meeting. It was the last meeting of Paul's time here, the last time he would visit this great city of Alexandria and Troas. And Luke notes a very interesting story that took place. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people because he intended to leave the next day and kept on talking until midnight. Luke describes how that Paul intended to leave the next day. Later in the passage, Paul leaves the great city of Alexandria and Troas and walks 30 miles down the coast to Asos. He sends the disciples by ship to that great harbor 30 miles south of this great city. Paul was intending to walk that 30 miles. But he meets with the disciples. He has a farewell meeting. It's noted that it's on the first day of the week. And so I read again, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. Paul knew that this would be the last time he would see the believers here at Troas. He would leave here and go down to Asos, catch the ship, go past Ephesus, and land at Miletus. There he would call for the Ephesian elders to come down and meet him. He would share his heart concern with them and tell them that I will never again see your face. They wept, they cried, they kissed, and he sailed on to Jerusalem where he was arrested and ultimately taken to Rome. Paul shares his heart burdens with the leaders of the church here at Troas. Luke says they were meeting on the first day of the week. They'd come together to break bread because Paul intended to leave early the next morning at daybreak. Paul went on talking and sharing, teaching until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Now I have to tell you that right now I'm perched quite high on what seems to be about a three-story window. Eutychus was sitting in a three-story window listening in this upstairs meeting room. There were many lamps there and Paul went on and on. He was sharing his heart concern because he knew he would not see these people again. Luke tells us, Eutychus went sound asleep. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. What an incredible story. Eutychus goes to sleep. He's in the third story. He falls back and the people catch their breath, they hear him hit the ground, they run outside and they see that he's dead. Verse 10, Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daybreak, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. What an intriguing story. Luke tells us that it happened on the first day of the week. Now many have taken this passage to mean that Paul was having a meeting on Sunday because he had transferred the solemnity of the Sabbath from Saturday the seventh day to Sunday the first day. Now that would be very curious, wouldn't it? Paul has tarried for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He still apparently is celebrating the feast. He's hoping to make Pentecost in Jerusalem at the temple. It would be very curious if Paul had adopted another day of worship. As we traveled through this great land in the footsteps of Paul, we noted how in Pisidian Antioch that nearly the whole city, both Jew and Gentile, came together on the Sabbath and then they were invited to come together on the next Sabbath. 
We've seen that when Paul was in Philippi, that he was accused of being a Jew and proselytizing Romans. Wouldn't that be curious if while in the city of Philippi, he had adopted the first day of the week and he was being accused of being a Jew? It makes no sense at all. As a matter of fact, Paul could say with a straight face and a sincere heart that he had done nothing against the fathers. No, he had not given up worshiping on the Sabbath. This was a farewell meeting. Paul had spent a week here. He knew he would never see these disciples again. And he was sharing his heart concern because he planned to leave the next morning at daybreak. He intended to walk the 30 miles down to the port of Assos. The question is, why does Luke include the story? Does he include the story to tell us that the church here at Troas had adopted the first day of the week? Of course not. He includes the story to tell us about Eutychus and how that Eutychus had fallen out of the window and how that he had been taken up for dead and yet was raised to life. It was a miracle that brought great encouragement to the believers of God's power. But the question is this, just when did this meeting happen? They had gathered together. It happened on the first day of the week. But what time were they breaking bread? Did they break bread before midnight or after midnight? A careful reading of the text tells us that Paul kept on talking until midnight and that Eutychus fell out of the window after midnight and that then Paul went upstairs and broke bread with the disciples and then at daylight left for Assos. And so the question is this, at what time of the day would Luke consider this meeting to be taking place? The breaking of bread clearly happens after midnight. The question would be, was Luke reckoning time as a Gentile or as a Jew? You see, Jewish people celebrate the day from sunset to sunset. After the sun would set on the Sabbath, that is what we would call Saturday night, that would be the beginning of the first day of the week. Not at midnight, but at sunset. Paul met with the disciples on the Sabbath. And then after the Sabbath had closed, they had a farewell meeting. He was sharing his heart concern, much like he will do with the Ephesian elders when he calls them down to Miletus. He knows this is the last time he will see them. And he meets with them sharing. He goes on and on, and it goes past midnight. And then Eutychus falls out of the window. The miracle happens. Paul comes upstairs. They share a meal together. They share the Lord's Supper together. And then at daylight, Paul walks 30 miles, a day's journey, up to Assos. And so again, we would ask the question, was the meeting happening on Saturday night? Was it simply a farewell meeting after Sabbath services? Certainly, this is a position the New English Bible takes, because it says, on the Saturday night, we came into the upper room and they had many lamps in the house, and then relates the story of Eutychus. Some would say, however, that it could not be on Saturday night, that Luke was a Gentile. Well, if you take that position, it's a very curious one to take. Then, Paul has come together on the first day of the week, but they break bread, that is, they celebrate the Lord's Supper after midnight on Monday morning. And then Paul walks the 30 miles to Asos. Either way, we see that Paul is not having a special religious meeting on the first day of the week. It's a farewell meeting, most likely happening on Saturday night, with Paul on Sunday morning walking the 30 miles up to Asos to meet the disciples who've gone by ship ahead of him. And so we see that this text is in complete harmony with all that we've seen of Paul through our journeys in his footsteps. Whether it was in Pisidian Antioch, or whether it was in Philippi, or in Corinth, indeed, he was thought of as a Jew because he was celebrating Shabbat. We've noted that Paul, indeed, was taking Christianity to a new level, recognizing that Judaism had its limits, recognizing 
that you did not have to be circumcised. That is, you did not have to become a Jew to be saved. No, Christianity was far beyond Judaism. And yet the Sabbath was an integral part of Paul's experience and also the experience of the early church. In Ephesus, we saw the great temple of Hadrian. Hadrian played a very important part in the change of the day of worship from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day of the week. In the beginning part of the second century, a Jewish leader named Simon Bar Kokhba led a rebellion. His real name was Simon Bar Kokhba, but he was named Bar Kokhba or son of a star. Simon Bar Kokhba led a rebellion against Rome. It was a tremendous rebellion. It went on for three years. They struck new coins saying the freedom of Israel. He was called the son of a star. He was considered by many to be the Messiah. He led this uprising and Rome came down with a terrible vengeance. Hadrian came in, destroyed the city. Today, as we walk on the streets of Jerusalem, there are very few places that we actually walk that Jesus walked because the city was rebuilt in the second century. It was rebuilt in Roman splendor, and it was named the Aelia Capitolina, the new capital of Palestine. Jews were forbidden to come within 50 miles of Jerusalem. It's very interesting that this edict also applied to Christians, because from the Roman mind, Jews and Christians were celebrating the same day. They must be the same people. As a matter of fact, there was a great controversy that was taking place in the early church. It was called Quattro Decimans. Most of the early church celebrated the crucifixion of Jesus on the 14th day of the first Jewish month, that is, on Passover. Jesus died on Passover, which was tied to a day of the month, not a day of the week. He rested in the tomb on the ceremonial Sabbath, and on the first day of the week, he came back to life. That was the 16th day of the first Jewish month. Now the fascinating thing is that the 14th day was Passover. The lamb would be killed at three in the afternoon. Then there was a ceremonial Sabbath. There were seven annual ceremonial Sabbaths that were not tied to a day of the week, but tied to days of the month. The year that Jesus died, the ceremonial Sabbath happened to coincide with the weekly Sabbath. Thus John says it was a high Sabbath. But on the 16th day, which that year happened to be the first day of the week, was the offering of the first fruits. The first fruit offering was incredible. The first ripening grains of barley were coming to fruition in Palestine. The priests would go and take some of those first ripening grains and bring them into the temple and dedicate the barley harvest unto God. This was taking place on the 16th day of the first Jewish month. Think of what happened that day. Jesus came back to life. Paul said that Jesus, the first fruits of them that should be raised from the dead, Jesus was indeed the first fruits of the resurrection. While the Jews were down waving their sheaf of barley in the temple, Jesus was ascending before the Father in highest heaven. You recall that when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn from the top to the bottom. The angel saying, there's no longer any need for earthly sacrifices because the Lamb of God has been offered for us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that Jesus was our Passover Lamb. And now he fulfills the other part of that feast, the wave sheaf offering, ascending as the first fruits of them that would be raised from the dead. Well, as I mentioned, this took place on the 14th, 15th, and 16th day of the first Jewish month. The early Christians did not celebrate it on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that is Good Friday and Easter Sunday. They celebrated it with Passover. But when the Bar Kokhba Rebellion brought down the wrath of Rome on Jews, Christians in Rome and in Alexandria, the two greatest cities of the Roman Empire, tried to distance themselves from Jews. It was really anti-Semitism. They tried to distinguish themselves by saying, we're not Jews. And so, in Rome, they chose to honor the resurrection of Jesus on the festival of Ishtar. Can you hear it? Ishtar, Easter. 
The festival of Ishtar was celebrated through the ancient Near East. It took place on the first Sunday after the full moon, after the spring equinox. It was a time of celebrating harvest. It was a time of celebrating life. Have you ever wondered why there are Easter eggs? Really, they're Ishtar eggs. And we see them all through the temples that we visited, all through the ruins where Paul preached. We see those eggs decorating the temples, symbols of fertility, symbols of life. Jesus, indeed, was resurrected from the dead on the first day of the week. But it was in fulfillment of the offering of the wave sheaf, the first fruits of them that would be raised from the dead. No, Paul was not teaching that we should worship on the first day of the week instead of the Sabbath. He was a Sabbath keeper through and through. We've seen that he even did a vow, cutting his hair, sailing from Sincrea to Caesarea, and going up and burning his hair in the temple, that he wanted to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Paul was Jewish through and through, but he recognized the limitations of Judaism. He recognized that Christianity must not be shackled to circumcision, that you did not have to be a Jew to be saved. And so, as we visited in Colossae, we saw that Paul wrote to that city, and he wrote on this very point. Paul said that you've been so completely forgiven by Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross, that the very list of the sins that you had committed has been blotted out. It's been nailed to the cross. The devil has been exposed. He's been made a public spectacle because he's defeated. He is a defeated foe. Therefore, in light of your complete forgiveness, Paul says, don't let anybody judge you whether you keep the festivals or you don't keep the festivals. Don't let anybody judge you whether you offer the drink offerings or the grain offerings because you have been forgiven through Jesus. You have been made whole and complete. As a Jew, Paul continued to keep the festivals. As a Jew, Paul continued by even offering a vow. He was arrested in the temple while performing a vow with several other men. But Paul says that if you're a Gentile, you don't have to keep the festivals. You don't have to keep Passover because Jesus is our Passover and he has been offered for us. He is the first fruit of the resurrection from the dead. So Paul says, don't let anyone judge you in these matters because your forgiveness was achieved by the death of Jesus on Calvary's cross. And to that, we say praise and honor and glory to our God. For Jesus has made us complete, one in Him. Paul recognized that if this division continued between Jew and Gentile, it would destroy the church. And so he bridges it with this wonderful teaching from Colossians chapter 2, showing the unity that we have in Jesus. It's an option to keep the feast. The question would be, is it an option about the Sabbath? Well, let me answer it in this way. Our salvation does not rest upon observing the Sabbath or not observing the Sabbath. Just as our salvation does not rest upon keeping any of God's commandments, our salvation rests upon what Jesus did at Calvary's cross. We are saved by grace through faith that's what he wrote to the church of Ephesus. That was his message over and over again. But he also wrote to the church of Ephesus that because we're saved by grace through faith, that we were also created in God to do good works to the glory and honor of God. And so, as he said to the church of Ephesus, we always want to do those things that are pleasing to the Lord. I know that's my desire. I hope it's yours too. Paul leaves the great city of Alexandria in Troas and walks 30 miles down the coast to Asos. He sends the disciples by ship to that great harbor 30 miles south of this great city. I'm walking among the ruins of the ancient temple of Athena built in the 6th century BC. This temple dominated the Acropolis of Assos. You can see the sparkling blue waters of the Aegean behind me. The 
Acropolis and temple could be seen for miles away and must have been a tremendous beacon to mariners sailing down the coast. Paul would have walked down this road to the harbor to meet his friends before catching the boat and sailing to Miletus, south of Ephesus. We're here at the port of Assos, a picturesque harbor village, a fishing village, as you can see, a working fishing village, just under the leeward side of Lebos Island. This is the port to which Paul walked from Alexandria and Troas, and here he rendezvoused with with Silas and Luke and the others who had taken the ship down from Alexandria and Troas to this port. And together they sailed down the coast past Ephesus to Miletus, where Paul called for the elders of the church to come and meet with him and gave him that farewell parting, that farewell instructions. We're now going down to Miletus, that spot where Paul called for the elders of the church and shared his heart concern telling them that he would never see their face again. He gave a moving appeal, reminding them how he had not been a charge to them, but had worked with his own hands while he had been in Ephesus for three years. He reminded them how that he had taught them from publicly at the hall of Tyrannus and from house to house. Paul continues his heartfelt appeal to the elders of Ephesus. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. And then he gives a stirring appeal, a deep heartfelt appeal. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood I know that after I leave, grievous wolves shall come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Paul shares one of his deepest warnings ever with the overseers, the elders of the church of Ephesus. He reminds them how that for three years he had taught them publicly about this. He says, I know after I leave that grievous wolves shall come in and not spare the flock. I know that after I leave that some of you listening to me right now will rise up and distort the truth to draw away disciples after yourselves. Paul had given a similar teaching when he wrote back to the church at Thessaloniki. He told them that before Jesus would come, there would be a falling away first, a perversion of the truth, an apostasia, a walking away from the gospel. Paul had warned the church at Thessaloniki that this would take place before Jesus would come. Now he warns the elders of Ephesus that the same would happen. Men of your own selves will arise and distort the truth, drawing away disciples after themselves. To the Thessalonians he had written that the mystery of iniquity is already at work. The mystery of anomia, a spirit of lawlessness. Paul senses this is going to happen in Ephesus as well. When Jesus writes his letter to the church of Ephesus, penned by John on the Patmos Island, he said, watch out for those who have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans taught a doctrine of antinomianism. They were teaching that in the freedom they had in Jesus that they did not have to be obedient. Paul warns that this will come and affect the church of Ephesus as well. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul reminds them that 
he was not a charge to them that he had worked at his trade of tent making with his own hands and he had supported his companions and he reminded them of the words of Jesus it's more blessed to give than to receive and then this final appeal when he had said this he knelt down with all of them and prayed they all wept and they embraced him and kissed him what grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see his face again then they accompanied him to the ship and after we had torn ourselves away from them we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. Paul shares with the elders of Ephesus that he'll never see their face again they're heartbroken they kneel together there by the beach they embrace they cry they hug they kiss and Paul boards the ship but he first prays with them that they will be faithful to the charge which they have received that they will run the race faithfully as he has run the race that they will complete the course that God has set for them just as he must complete the course God has set for him they kneel here at Miletus and they pray a prayer of commitment join me as we pray together Father, as we think of that time when Paul came to this port, this great harbor city, and called for the elders of the church to come down and meet him here, and how that they shared, they hugged, they kissed, because Paul had said he would never see their face again. Father, help us to run the race as Paul did. Help us to follow wherever you lead. May our footsteps follow your footsteps, just as Paul's have before us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us for our next chapter in this exciting series. Paul goes to Jerusalem for Passover. There, there's a tremendous turn of events when Paul must appeal to go before Caesar. Amen. Um, thank you all. So, just trying to get everything situated. Any um, any initial thoughts? I don't know if anything specifically stood out or anything that you didn't know or. Uh... I don't think I really. Um thought about at all or considered that the Christians um, would have would have celebrated or, or acknowledged um, Christ's death and resurrection, you know, year by year, but it, it does make sense, um, you know, and, then, and that they said that they celebrated the day that it happened, not the day of the week, but the, but the day of the month, which makes a lot of sense because an anniversary happens mm -hmm. on a day or a birthday happens on a day. Um, and I, I don't think we always think about that, you know, and then how it, how it turned into Sunday and how it got a, kind of got morphed into something completely different. Yeah, it's a, it is a fascinating, um, switch. Like, <laughs> I, I, I guess sometimes as I, as I watch all of this, I, I think about, you know, the, like Satan's um, ability, if you will, to sort of play a long game. Like he, he doesn't need to do things. Things don't need to seem jarring, right? They just need to sort of slowly progress at times, and and slowly change because it it is a it is a it it is a slight different concept. You know, maybe not slight different, slightly different, but it's 
it's like, yeah, in the Jewish mindset, everything was sort of based on this day of the month, um, festivals and all that. Uh, and yet, and yet here to start doing this thing as the day of the week and then um, <clears throat> changing that up. No, that, that's, uh, that, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Um, one of the years, I don't know how long, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I just, I always go back to the first time that I read the book of Acts just in, in one in one sitting, um, as opposed to like, okay, reading a few chapters here and there. And it it was remarkable to me, just the, the level of Sabbath commentary and just um, like, like it, it, like the whole question actually goes away. And to me, in terms of the early church, when you just, when you look at the book of Acts as a, as a, as one story, one sort of progressive, we're just telling what happened and, and just the way Sabbath comes up and, and worship, it's just a, it's a constant theme, maybe not theme, but it's just a, just a matter of fact, it's not even, you know, there is no, there is no Sabbath Sunday debate in the, in the, in the book of Acts. Um, any, any debates always sort of got put in after the fact. Um, but that's, you, you know, there, the, uh, the thing that, one of the, the thoughts that I had was that, you know, as people, um, and I don't know if you guys agree or not agree, but as people, we are like inherently tradition lovers. Like, and, and, and that's across all cultures. It's, it, it doesn't matter where you go on this planet. You're going to, find, if you find people, you're going to find traditions. You're going to find things that people do that they, that they gravitate to. Um, and so because of, because that's a fact, um, it, it's important, I guess, to sometimes um, look at the traditions that are being formed. You know, um, and to and to to be cautious of some, and you know, um, hold tight to others because they they have different impacts on on people and on their lives. Uh, I, I was in my mind sort of thinking about uh, some of the traditions that I like. You know, there are some some traditions that I think you can give or take, right? Yeah, uh, some traditions you can kind of, um, you know, it might be bad but it wouldn't necessarily cause you to be further or closer to Christ um one one thing happened to me I was I was saying uh earlier this year but a buddy of mine his well his mom died and I went to the repass and the repass was at a technically it was at a it was at a bar you know for for all intents and purposes and I say that because it was at a place that sold alcohol uh, so I'm at the repass talking to the family and I'm sitting down at this table, and the uh, uh, one of the guys comes over to me, one of the, one of the older gentlemen, and he taps me on the shoulder and he says, "Excuse me, you have to take your hat off in here." And I, I said, "Oh, oh, my bad." And I, you know, and I took my hat off, and I looked around and realized, yeah, I, I'm the only one here with a hat on, <laughs> you know. And I, and I, and it was a bar, you know, but. They had, th this was their thing. And I thought somewhere along the lines that I, I think, I think that's a, that's almost a religious thing. You know, if, if somebody came into our church and there was a guy with a hat on, I, you know, traditionally might say, please take it off. I don't think I've actually ever approached anybody at church because of it, but, um, you know, a church might say that, might say, look, look, if you're a guy in, inside the building, don't take, don't wear your hat. Um, and if that's a tradition, I, I, I gather that's fine, but it's not a, I don't think putting your hat on or taking your hat off is necessarily going to bring you closer or move you further away from, from Christ. But then I thought there are traditions that we do in, in some churches, you know, or in some denominations um, that, that I think do, they're, like they're traditional, but they, they really do bring you, you know, closer to Christ, this, this idea, this concept um, that you know, in our local church that we practice of potluck is, uh, I think that has a, a, an effect of 
unifying the church. I think it has an effect on bringing people closer to Christ. Um, it, are, are there tra traditions in your mind that you would that you would say, yeah, this is a this is a tradition. It's not like came down from Sinai, but it's a tradition that I think really enhances a person's relationship with Christ. Can you think of some that are good that that you find are enhancing relationships with Christ? And I say that because I know this is kind of going on the internet and somebody else might be looking for ideas. I'll say another one, prison ministry. Um, I think prison ministry is, uh, for, for those who do it, I have a hard time thinking it doesn't bring someone closer to Christ. I just have a hard time believing that. Did I hear someone else say something? Well, I was thinking about um, our week of prayer that we do. Week of prayer. Week of prayer. And when um, we do it, you know, we do it to begin the new year, but that's also, I think, a tradition that we've always kept in our church. And that is a way to bring people closer to Christ. You know, it, 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 it certainly is. And it's like, and it's one of those where I'm like, yeah, and I like it. <laughs> I, you know, and it like it definitely brings people together. And the fact that it's done to begin the year, in, in many churches, it's done at a different time. Mm -hmm. um, but in our case, we say, okay, look, we're gonna we're gonna close out the year and begin the year in prayer. It's a, it's a great. I think it's a if if there are churches or someone watching and. You want to know ways of of, uh, of galvanizing your your members? Yeah, a week of prayer, actually having it, um, and and maybe even moving it to to a time that that people can really gather around. Yeah, I would definitely say that. Can't even have that written down. <laughs> Passing out literature, giving giving away steps to Christ and. Great controversy and desire of ages to, you know, members and neighbors and people in the neighborhood. When, when I grew up, and, and, and some of you who maybe have been in, in the members of the Adventist Church for a while, it was, it was just such a common thing. Um, you know, you'd hear the, we'd hear the term Bible worker or whatever, but it was just a common thing to, to go out and hand out literature like mm -hmm. it was uh people people sometimes sold books or whatever um and actually made money you know i could make a living off of it but but the the knocking on doors um yeah it's uh even just standing on the corner i i can remember myself and a friend bought a lot of steps to christ and at Lark Fest, this was years ago. I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of steps to Christ, and we because wow. we knew there was going to be a lot of people there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the three of us divided up Lark Street, and we just handed out the steps to Christ. It, it's it's fascinating you say that um, because I know a long time ago, I don't know if they there used to be something called a, a Black Arts Festival it used to take place in downtown Albany. Um, and I remember I've, I've, had, I've been in these conversations and, you know, this, for those who are, are not aware, this thing used to take place on the Sabbath every, every year, every summer. Um, and, and I would talk to people and there, there would be people who had objections um, because of what was taking place. And there was all, it, it, there would be this divide of like, should we go there and hand out uh, uh, materials? Oh, but, we're going to be there handing out materials on the Sabbath and there's all this other stuff going on. And, and this, this divided people, but I, I think it's, I think it's never a bad time to, to uh, try to reach people. Uh, I just, you know, I was like, maybe I'm just that liberal, but I just, you know, if that's where the folks are, um, that's, that's where you go. Um, so yeah, yeah. I don't. I, Lark Fest might not have been too different than than the uh, than the Black Arts Festival, but it, you know, it's probably the thing is, I say the thing with that is, I wouldn't take a, a new believer in a, an environment like that. That may send that may send a, a wrong message, you know. 
but somebody that's pretty much rooted and grounded wouldn't be a problem. Got it. Like if you catch me and I'm new in the faith mm-hmm. and I'm more interested in who's on the stage than I am in, uh, <laughs> in, 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 you know, spreading the word, then yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a fair, that's fair. Um, I like that though, but, but yes, mm-hmm. knocking any, anything that gets you in the community. Yeah, because that's where the people are, you know. Got to go where the people are. Yeah. yeah. In, our, in, our, in our local church, um, again, and this, other people may do different things, but we've, uh, this, this is really the first year in, what, 20 plus years um, that we haven't, because of COVID, been able to do a, a choir fest. But around Thanksgiving, we, we've had a choir fest where we bring choirs from multiple areas, multiple churches and come and sing together. And I think that there's something just heartwarming about it. I, you know, I just, I've always thought it was a great idea. And, and, and sometimes it's just a high of just um, being able to, to show who you are um, and actually show that you're not afraid of, of, of intermingling, you know, of, of being kind. I shouldn't say intermingling, but of just being kind um, with with other people who are also Christians and trying to trying to figure this thing out. Um, yeah, I, I you know I I won't harp on it, but I, I would say you know the good works, anything that that presses us on towards good works is is worth keeping. Um, but it's also it's also important, and I and I guess I'd stress that too to to uh, to be careful or to be cautious, right? Because something that you start might might be the type of thing that you you don't want to hold too close to, um, or or it may start a bad precedent, right? Sometimes you do things and you say, "Well, we've always done this," and and it might be a bad precedent, you know. And so, or somebody says, "Hey, let's do this," and you might think we're only going to do this one time, and that one time becomes two times or three times, and all of a sudden you know, the horse is out the barn and it's hard to get it back. So, you know, I, I think, I think traditions are great, but I, I think it's always good to, to scrutinize. Um, I, I think that's that, really, um, you know, sitting there talking about the traditions. I think sometimes we, we think of new traditions sometimes negatively in the church. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but they can be positive depending on what our focus becomes. I mean, if our focus starts to become about the celebration and how we can, you know, just enjoy ourselves. And that's not really the idea, but if we remember that, you know, the idea of it, any of the traditions is, you know, to give praise and to keep the focus on God, then it just, it can be very positive. Yeah, no, totally agree. Um, I think along those lines also, that that it might be important to change things up once in a while because um you know a, a tradition that that started out as something where we focus on god and glorify god and praise god can turn into over the years something completely different and and when we try new things to to help bring our focus back on god it can keep it fresh it can keep our minds where they they need to be which is on christ you know the because traditions have an ability to do so much good, it, it behooves Satan to try and um, corrupt um, good traditions. And so even a, even a good thing can be, good things can be corrupted. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's important to maybe sometimes review, you know, take a second look at uh, what's being done. I think it's interesting with, because of the situation we've been in with COVID, we, we've had to, to change many things that, that we do all the time, you know? Um, we traditionally, we meet at, at a church building. We didn't do that for several months. We, we still worshiped on Sabbath. We still worshiped together, but we had to find another way to do it. And, and it caused us to have to relook at everything, literally everything, like the whole entire program, you know, what was important, what was going to bring our focus on God, how is it going to work in this new environment? Um, 
you know, reaching people that we've never reached before uh, due, due to the COVID circumstances where, where we would not have been pushed into that arena um, quite so hard previously. You know, we, we now we're reaching people and we would now we're doing things that, that we've never done before um, due to this, you know, so it's, I, I just, I find this last year very educational um, in that way, because we have a hard time getting out of our traditions of like, well, we don't need to, we don't need to think of anything new because, you know, we've always done it like this. And, and the thing is, is that we've reached people we've never reached before. I mean, look, look at this, this coming Sabbath. Normally, most years we've done caroling. We go to people's doors, we knock on their houses. We may That's go to another tradition house. though, too, it's right? And a good one. And a good one, right? And we, we bring, uh, we, we sing and, and, you know, people appreciate it. Um, and we go to different parts of the city and, and do that. And this year, it's going to look a little different. And I'm very interested to see what, what the, you know, what the Lord has in store, because we're trying something that we would not have thought to try, probably, more than likely. Um, otherwise, if, if we had, you know, just done our normal tradition of, of, of caroling, we're, we're doing something different. Yeah, it, it's, um, yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, there's one of the, one of the um, episodes we were talking about the, this whole thing where, you know, when Paul would go into a city, just traditionally, he'd go into a city, find the synagogue, go in there, speak, worship, right? But he goes to another place and it's like, oh, there's no synagogue. Um, okay, so he goes where there's prayer, right? So it, it's not like he says, oh, man, can't do it. Can't, can't go. There's, there's no building. He goes where there's prayer and he prays. Like, like it doesn't, it doesn't stop. Like, you know, the gospel just does not end because uh, an obstacle is here or a roadblock is there. It, it just continues on. Uh, Paul, Paul wasn't moved at all. Yeah. It's like, how do you do ministry with one hand tied behind your back? You know, what, how, do, how does it change? What, what do you now have to think of? And now who are you reaching? You know, that, that's sort of how we operated this year, right? Yeah. It, it's, well, I, I won't go into it too much, but it's, you know, I've, I've read a lot of things about just businesses and how businesses are operating and how they're being forced to, in some cases, do things that they should have done a long time ago. Um, and in other ways, just realizing that, yeah, some aspects of this change are going to be for for a while and they're for the better, right, um, in some instances. So it's it's just fascinating to see how that works. He, he touched on something um, in this episode that I just, I just loved it, okay? I'm going to share my screen. Um, hold on a second here. I want to read these two passages, one from... Uh, the book of John, chapter 20, and the other from uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 27. And they'll obviously, if I can share my screen, they will tie in exactly to uh, something that he mentioned. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, or Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And then in Matthew chapter 27, 50 to 53, it says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So here's why this, this whole thing excites me. Because uh, like I would mentioned maybe a few weeks ago, that there was this particular book that I had gotten called uh, The Cross and Its Shadow. Uh, Stephen and Haskell is the author. And he sort of, you know, maybe I've just been in 
not ar around the right people. But anyway, this guy explained this whole thing. And when you, when you talk about the, and he talked about in here, uh, the, the, the 14th, 15th and 16th day and, and how everything sort of lined up with, with, with these, these particular days of the month, that the 15th day, um, he used two words. He said it's, it was the first fruits, um, but also it was the wave offering. So it's the first fruits and the wave offering. And so the, the way it would work is um, it literally, the, uh, on, the, on the 16th day, the wave offering, the, the priest would go through and the, the barley would be just, you know, it's springtime. The barley is just kind of growing, coming up. And the priest would go through and grab a handful of it, you know, and 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 cut it off, and walk to the temple with this with, with this with this sheaf of a uh, of barley, and go into the temple into the front, and and wave it in the front, uh, waving it to God as if to say that this is the first fruits. This is the this is the first fruits. And it's as if to say, like, imagine the harvest, right? Like the first fruits is this, this, this little bit, but but the harvest is gonna be phenomenal, you know. And so here you, you see this, this instance where Jesus is resurrected, right? And he meets Mary and he's like, Mary, you can't touch me because I got somewhere to go. I, I haven't been I haven't been to my father yet. Like <laughs> And 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 it's the it's the day of the first fruits. It's the day of the wave offering. And so, at some point, Jesus goes to heaven, right? And we know that because in a later passage, he comes back and he's like, "Here, you can touch my side. You can touch me. Feel free. Like like I've already I've effectively I've gone to heaven and now I can be touched." So he 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 goes to heaven as the priest, but also as the first fruits. But he can go to heaven and he can, as, as the way the priest would wave the wave offering to say, look at this, look at this first fruits, imagine the harvest. He could go there with other resurrected saints as a first fruits and say to his father, imagine the harvest, imagine the harvest. Like, like in that first fruits, they could see us. They could see generations down as we are become part of the harvest that, that'll happen because the first fruits happen, there's gonna be a good harvest because the first fruits happen, because of Christ, because of this power of the resurrection, there's going to be a harvest. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I wanna be part of that harvest. I don't care if it happens, you know, if I don't die, go, don't go to sleep. Uh, or if I do, I just want to be a part of that harvest. I want to be a part of that presentation to say, yes, this, this is the harvest. So we have an opportunity to, to be co-laborers in this work. And I, I look forward to it. It is, uh, it is, it is fascinating. It is, it's fascinating to me how, how God puts so many things in place to teach us, to teach us, to show us. And, and then Christ comes and just fulfills beyond reason, beyond all doubt and says, yes. And then, and then, and then Paul just touches on it all. So I, I just, I want to, I want to thank you all for, um, for coming out again or, or, or tuning in, if you will. Um, let's, let's look forward to that harvest and let's for, look forward to being co-laborers any way we can, any way we can. Through the through the through the good works, Lord, um, just bow your heads with me as we pray, and then we'll close out. Father God, we thank you again for another day. We thank you for another opportunity that we have to be co-laborers with you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ, not just as the as the offering, but as the first fruits. And we want to be in that number. We look forward to the time where we can see you face to face. Be with us throughout our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you all again for joining us. Join us again on Wednesday. Uh, we're, we're, in the, we're in the final stretch. Um, Wednesday at 7 p.m. we'll be going over 
the ti the title is the appeal to Caesar, the appeal to Caesar. So Paul Paul's journey is is a uh, he's it's coming to an end and 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 it's and it's clear. I think it's even clear to him. So uh, again, thank you again for joining us. This now concludes our uh, evening presentation. God bless you. God bless you too.